Good morning, everyone, and evening if you're overseas. Um, this is the, actually the fourth episode of a series of introductions to just um, the Just Council series, as many of you know. We often go into a single thing like units and measures or organizations or agreements, and then we go into a lot of detail on a given thing and spend a whole hour. Um, but what's lost in all that detail is the big picture. So what we started a few weeks, well, a few months ago now, this is the fourth and final edition. Um, so there's not a whole lot to cover. I'm going to do a little bit of review and then we're going to talk about extensions to just an ongoing things that are happening. So we just went through the introductions, start recording. We already did. So just to now some of you will have seen some of these, some not. So I'm just going to give a little bit of background for everyone. The, this the, it was about 100 and 100 odd sides, 120 odd sides altogether going through the whole of GIST. So we did a quick introduction, looked at the design goals, and really spent most of the time looking at the most often used concepts. We didn't go through a complete laundry list of every single property and every single class. It was really the, the main ones and how they work together. And we illustrated each section with some common patterns that are used on a day to day basis by reontologists working with our clients. Um, but again, those who are not familiar with just it, what is it in the big picture? It's it's basically a starter kit for building your enterprise ontology. It has all the things that a typical organization has if you're going to build a model of your organization. Um, now, after having seen this whole series and studying just a bit, the idea is that you will understand really the background purpose and the uses for GIST. You'll understand its overall structure, what the key classes are and what the key properties are and how they work together. And you'll know just enough about just so that you'll be able to, you know, look at other ontologies and say, oh, I see where this goes in just. So there's a concept called company and you look around and just say, oh, I know where that goes. Organization. Great. Um, you'll be able to also create your own ontologies based on just you, you load just in and then you start from scratch using things and connecting them up to just. And also that you'll have enough to start exploring and just kind of do things on your own outside of um, semantic arts per se. So this is what we went through over these past uh, several sessions. And so I'm just going to briefly go through each of these um, persons and organizations central to any organization. What the people are do things and organizational structures are responsible and they sign agreements and things like that. We talked about physical things and substances, landmarks. Um, we did with with Procter and Gamble, Tim Smith some years ago. Substances they they make um, shampoos and things like that, and those are modeled as substances. Um, places, of course, are very important. Events, things happen. Time, temporal things, things happen at a particular time, and dates are very common. You know, when when did somebody create something? When did they submit it? When did it get approved? Lots and lots of dates. So there's a variety of time related um, properties. Uh, we talked a lot about addresses and identifiers. Um, things that seem pretty straightforward, but when you dig right into it, you realize, well, there's a little bit of subtlety there. And so we went through a lot of that. And again, we showed a number of patterns when we went through that section. Um, talked a little bit about intellectual property, not a whole lot to say there. That includes things like brands, software applications, things like that. Um, we spend quite a lot of time on categories and collections. We have a whole approach that we developed and refined at Semantic Arts for representing categories, enumerated lists, um, things like that. People often throw hundreds of thousands or, uh, well, not that's an exaggeration. People often throw many hundreds and sometimes thousands of classes in an ontology, and but they don't say anything whatsoever about what it means to be a member of the class. So it's essentially just a naked taxonomy. So we have a separate way of representing taxonomies using categories, and we also have collections for grouping things together. Um, intention is a broad kind of abstract class. We would never generally create an instance of an intention per se, but intention is all about what you want to do or should or shouldn't do. And so th common things there, th agreements, commitments, offers, all that is about intention. So I, I offer you a product. I'm going to sell you some head and shoulders shampoo, three, three bottles of 16 ounces each for $17. That's an offer. 
Anyone can come along and that's essentially a one sided agreement. I promised you that I will sell it to you for that price over this time period. And that's like a commitment insurance companies. We've done work with insurance, so that's where commitments would come in. Products, things that you actually sell, things that would show up in a catalog, um, services. We have classes and properties to cover those things. Templates, um, you know, like a structure from which you build things, uh, something that shows up from time to time. It's not heavily used over the years, but we do use it from time to time. Another big thing, reports, content. Um, Media language languages is a variety of things there. And then we had quite a lot of material and we've used extensively over the years with quite a large number of um, clients. Me, just me personally, I've worked with six or seven clients where we've spent a fair amount of time modeling out different units of measures, electrical products, um, you know, other kinds of things, medical things, past what's your C-reactive protein or what's your blood sugar glucose level and when was it measured, all this kind of stuff. Um, and the green means things we've covered. So each of the previous four sessions I started and then I continued where there's where the green stopped. So there's really actually only one more class uh, grouping of classes to cover and then we're going to start looking at properties. So this is what's coming up next. So what is this class called schema metadata? Well, basically, it's an abstract superclass for things. What we would discover is we have things like maybe an all concept like class. Sometimes you have to refer to that. Or more commonly, we're we're working with a number of clients and have done over the years with data catalogs um, and schema. You know, if you have a data catalog saying, well, what does this table mean? What does this field mean in this table? Does this field contain privacy information that we need to track? And all those kinds of things lump up and go under the category of schema metadata. We try to avoid having orphan classes, and that's what schema metadata is for. So if you can't figure out where something goes, look at the nature of the thing and say, is this kind of a metadata sort of a thing? And if it is, then probably just stick it under schema metadata. OK, so that's it for the big wide picture of scope and, and the main classes and some of the patterns. And now I'm just going to go through um, not say a whole lot about every single one, but these are the I, what I've walked through is we've got maybe 100 odd properties and I just walked through the ones and picked out for this slide the most commonly used ones. So I'll just say a little bit about that. The is categorized by property is fundamentally used for our categories. So if you have um, maybe a status for a, for a task or an activity and it's really just two statuses, active and inactive. And so those essentially become categories. So you would say that particular task has status of active or inactive when we use the property as categorized by to put things into those buckets. Um, has part, part of, very commonly used for putting like pieces of things, companies are parts of other companies, sub organizations, et cetera. Givers and recipients. So this is for commitments, a, a, a sale, for example, or an agreement. I agree to sell you this item. And you if you pay me this amount of money, so the giver is the seller and the recipient. Hang on. So there's an obligation. I have to pay you X amount of money. So the, the recipient is the one who receives the money. The giver is the one who gives the money. Um, identifiers we talked a lot about, so the, the, the property identifies and the inverse is identified by. Um, things get created, and so we have a property called produces for those kinds of things. Uh, we have collections, and the way you put something in a collection is to use the property is member of or has member. Um, and things control or govern. This is a pretty generic, we use it for a lot of different things, so we don't have a separate property called controls. If you want to say something that controls something else, then just use governs instead. Now, if you really mean something subtly different, then create a sub property of governs called controls and then indicate in the text and exactly what you mean and how it's different from the more broader governs. But more or less in English, governs and controls are closely matched, they're near synonyms. Contains geographically is, is like, I'm not sure if it technically is a sub property of, is part of, but it could be or has part. So this is for geographic regions that are fully contained within other geographic regions. Things have physical locations. That's a pretty important thing. So that points to 
uh, some comment, something which corresponds to a place. We talked about places, landmarks and regions and countries and things like that. Addresses relate to physical locations, but the address itself is not a, a physical location. Um, and then addresses are important because it's like, how do you communicate to a particular address or who's it? What's the contact point? And maybe you have an email address to contact for administrative purposes or an email to contact for technical purposes, perhaps for an application that you purchased. And there's two contact emails there. Um, for, let's see, things. Sometimes there's things get moved from and, and you say, well, this came from this place and this goes to this other place. Some of these or comes from an agent and goes to an agent. Things have start times, end time, lots of different kinds of timings, and we just have some of the key ones. But you, we end up in most enterprise ontologies creating a bunch of date properties, but we have some core ones. When did I think is recorded at is going away, but I'm not sure at the moment you, you, you'd you say when something got recorded um, for units and measures. We have a, a way to a sophisticated mechanism, very powerful semantic mechanism for building up complex units using numerator, denominator, multiplicand and multiplier. Um, we have a property for linking things to quantities. So, for example, if you weigh 82 kilograms like I do, then they would say Michael Eschold has magnitude 82 kilograms. Or you could have a sub property of has magnitude and call it has weight, something like that. Um, things have units of measure, for instance, for example, 82 kilograms or maybe 180 pounds. The unit of measure is pound or kilogram. Um, and then there's things that have standard units. So the a unit like um, mile has a standard unit which is meter because it's a distance and so in base units point to the the base unit so example kilometer is not a base unit but base unit there are base units there has jurisdiction over is something that arises from time to time um, is about connects a content to the thing in the real world that it, that it's about so for example if there's a document about a merger, then maybe you have a set of instances of mergers, and then you say, well, this document is about that particular merger. Conforms to, so we have specifications and just, and if you create something, it may or may not conform to it. So this is a way that you could say something conforms to it. Is based on is an interesting one. So if you have a template that you created something, then you would say it's based on that template. Is based on shows up in a variety of places. It just turns out to be a convenient property, so watch out for that one. Ownership obviously is important. Um, contained text is for, I'm um, just saying, if you have a t identifier, for example, it has some text to it. Things have names, things have descriptions. I don't know if description is here. We have introduced something called just description. Uh, as a convention, is it a question always arises, often arises, if you give something a name, how is that different from its pref label? That's an interesting question. We struggle with that a little bit. What I've come to realize is one, one approach that I tend to use is if the thing has a name in real life, then use just name. Your laptop almost certainly will not have a name. Your coffee mug will not have a name. Your car might or might not, but people have names, organizations have names. And so if it's something that's universally regarded as a name, if people talk about it as a name, then use just name. And you may be the case that if you really want pref label, then you may have some duplication there. Um, so that's that's one way to use. The other thing is description. When to use just description versus scope definition. So our convention there is for classes and properties and categories. So categories are instances of um, these category classes such as status. So an instance of the status class would be active. Another instance would be inactive. But since these are really corresponding to categories, you can give them scopes definitions because it's defining meaningful things that are related to the subject matter of the, of the company. So we use scopes definition for classes, for properties, and for instances of categories. And for, ins for regular instances, like an instance of an organization or an instance of an agreement, most of those things don't have descriptions, but sometimes they do, in which case use the property. And I don't think it's actually here. So I should update this slide. 
there's a property that we've introduced called just description. So I'm going to just pause there for a minute and because I'm just kind of rambling through lots of things and see if anybody has any thoughts or comments or questions. So, I mean, a, a way to keep it straight in my head is name really means formal name. Um, in, kind of. in most cases, yeah. Yeah, now some people, yes, yeah, I'm going to just say yes, basically, yep. Yeah. And again, you can do whatever you want, and we just try to come up with conventions that make sense, and then we try to be consistent across the company. So that when we shift people from one project to another, which happens from time to time, people would say, oh, I know how to do this because this is we use this convention across the board. Okay, so that's it for the grand summary overview of GIST. Now, a bunch of the slides that we saw over the past several sessions have some had been updated a lot of them were old and they had already been updated and some still needed to update and we've got a guy with us steve shellum offered to update some of those more slides so there will be a more up-to-date version one of these days but the truth is just as a little bit of a moving target most things remain the same for long periods of time but we are actively tweaking a lot of things simplifying and we're going to go through in the next 15 20 minutes whatever we've got left some of the changes. Um, so how is just evolving? Well, first of all, it's essentially being developed collaboratively by Semantic Art staff. And we host it on GitHub. It's mostly kept in Turtle files. But when we publish it, we, we export different um, syntaxes. So you can choose whichever you want. There's also lots of converters out there. So whether we provide the syntax or not, it's easy to get the syntax you want. Uh, we have style guides. We have documentation, release notes. Um, and we also have you know, um, some starting to put in some shapes to indicate conformance to our style guide. Anyone can add issues and we encourage you to do so. We have had a fair amount of contribution from the broader just community outside of semantic arts and we take these things seriously. Internally, we have meetings once or twice a month to go over the different issues that arise. Um, and we have major releases every year or two. We don't actually have a schedule. It's more just as things evolve. When is it? When do we say, you know what? There's just some major changes. It's time for a major release. We are currently on release 11.1.0. So summary, why use GIST? You can build better ontologies faster. Why better ontologies? Because we have a lot of axioms in there. When you run inference, you can find mistakes that you wouldn't otherwise find. Why faster? Because we've thought about a lot of things that you're going to need anyway, and so you don't have to think about it from scratch. It's designed for business people by business people. So it covers the key concepts that arise in any enterprise. And we're not using philosopher friendly terminology. We're using business friendly terminology that anybody on the street can understand. And there is a growing and continues to be more and more active. I'm really pleased today to see half a dozen, maybe 10 or so people outside of semantic arts showing up, this just gets a lot of interest, which we're really happy about. And it is actively evolving. So next 15, 20 minutes, half hour, we're gonna talk about some of that evolution. And what we're gonna have now, I'm gonna pass over, and I'm gonna click the slides, but I'm gonna pass over to Rebecca Yonis, who's gonna talk, talk to us about the latest release. Rebecca? Yeah, hi. Um... So yes, Michael has already mentioned that we do, we're actually on a quarterly release schedule. So we just released 11.1.0. Uh, that was our end of September release, which came out on uh, the first couple of days of October. Um, just to, and, and the uh, internal development group meets um, twice a month to triage issues, decide what we're gonna implement, what we're not gonna implement. So. Uh, as Michael said, we really uh, welcome issues, uh, issue submissions from outside semantic arts um, and even PRs. If you want to submit a PR, we will review it and see where we want to merge it. Um, so just 11.1.0, as you can see from the uh, increment in the, the middle uh, digit, it's a minor release. Um, just to go over the way we distinguish major, minor, and patch releases, 
um, a major release includes non-backward compatible changes where reasoning is affected. A minor release uh, includes semantic changes that are backward compatible. For example, adding a new class adds new semantics, but it's backward compatible. Um, in minor releases, we also, uh, instead of removing terms, we deprecate them and put them in a deprecation file, which can be imported if you're still using those terms. And a patch change is something like an annotation that doesn't affect formal semantics. We have, um, we have been up till recently pretty strict about the major minor distinction, but we've slightly loosened up uh, recently so that um, in a minor release, we feel we, we sometimes include infants and changes that in practice won't affect anybody. So for example, um, in 11.1.0, we removed the, uh, the restriction that a collection has to have at least one member, um, which does affect inferencing. However, this is a fairly um, likely to be an inference that nobody is actually depending on. Okay. Yep, next slide. Mm -hmm. So uh, we did a little tidying up, which we do in all our releases. We clean up annotations and improve the accuracy, clarity, grammatic, grammar. Um, we correct a few small errors. So for instance, in this release, we noticed that we have just we had just proceeds, just proceeds directly, just follows directly, but we were missing just follows. So that got rooted. Um, we changed cardinality restriction on contemporary event that it should have an actual start date time, not just a start date time, which could be planned or actual. Um, so a contemporary event being something that has started but not ended, it does have to have an actual start date time. And we deprecated a few terms um, that were not used. You can look at all of the specific changes in the <laughs> release notes, which are included in the release package um, or available online at that link on my initial slide, which you may not have caught. Um, but it's also there's also a link from the website. Which link? Oh, this link here. Uh, that link, yeah. And and you'll find that on the um, page on our website about GIST as well. Okay, next one. So um, one of the more we did some significant work on collections. Um, we decided to allow empty collections, um, you know, which is more logically correct than requiring that a collection has one member. So, for example, um, we, for ex what did we, what did we, did, Michael, do you remember what kinds of use cases we were imagining for this? Well, there could be a collection of things which comes and goes, people come and go membership comes and goes and then might somebody three people might quit the board and then suddenly you don't have any board members and so for the moment we don't have anything right, but we right. didn't okay. you know, things like that yeah. it's a, yeah. it's a bit of a, an edge case but we just decided to correct it for semantic yeah. accuracy yeah we also added the property has first member to a collection because so members of ordered collections are connected by uh proceeds directly and follows directly, but based on the uh, open world assumption, just because something has no preceding member uh, or, or no, not asserted to have a preceding member, we can't conclude that it is the first member. So this allows us to say this is the first member. It's sort of the same uh, idea that SCOS uses with has taught concept. Um, and we also said that proceeds and follows and proceeds directly follows directly the sub properties cannot apply to objects at the same position in a sequence, uh, which they previously could. So that's analogous to greater than or equal to versus just greater yeah, than. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. No longer, it no longer means greater than or equal to. Yes. Proceeds are is the same. Yeah. We, um, I think originally that had 
followed um, sort of the mathematical definition of perceived and follows. Is that right, Michael? Um, yeah, it just was. Where, yeah, it's a small, it's a small detail, but it originally started by saying let's just use greater than or equal to because it has some mathematically nice properties, and then it turns out that in practice it wasn't important. So then we just went with the. Yeah, no, but in the real world, nobody would think of proceeds as including being in the same position. As yeah, someone. exactly. Okay, next one. Um, and we've added a new feature, which uh, we're using shackle prefix declarations to um, to us to declare what prefixes we use in the ontology and what namespaces they refer to. Um, and the purpose of that is to provide a machine readable definition of the prefix and what namespace that refers to. Um, and it removes the need for manual configuration in applications. So for example, um, a visualizer can read this prefix de declaration and substitute the prefix for the full namespace in order to make the display more concise. Um, so that looks like this. In GIST, we do define the GIST prefix declaration in GIST itself, and we have others in a separate file um, that can be ingested for all the prefixes that we use in GIST, like SCOS, um, sh the shackle prefix, and so on. Okay. Um, so moving on to GIST 12, which we anticipate to release at the end of December, um, the most significant change in GIST 12 will be a redesign of units and magnitudes, which Michael is going to talk about at the end because he and Phil Blackwood are designing that change. Um, but I'll mention a couple of the other um, significant changes. So we've decided to remove inverses from GIST core. Um, and the reasoning is that um, they can be problematic uh, for a couple of reasons. They can blow up inferencing, and I've seen this in one of my client um, projects, um, which uses RDFOX, so inferencing is uh, automatically uh, occurs at load time. And um, so any assertion of just has part, for example, is then um, the inverse uh, assertion just has is part of was being asserted and memory just blew up because of the overload. Um, the other thing is the data could be entered in consistently. Um, so even in that case, some uh, conversion files were generating is part of, whereas some were using has part, uh, which then requires that you query in both directions if you're not using reasoning. Um, and then finally, they're, we decided they're not really necessary. They're in the ontology for convenience, um, but you can always use inverse property paths and sparkle and shackle, and you can use owl inverse of in restrictions, such as in this example. Um, we we never even we've never had a just categorizes, but if you want to say that everything this product type uh, class categorizes is um, a product, then you can use the inverse of construction in the on property assertion as shown. Okay. Um, oops, I think we're missing something. Uh, oh no, we're not. This Sorry. is about room. This is about yeah, inverses. No, which inverses to keep? Right, rules right, right. Okay. So which ones do we keep? Um, the first consideration is cardinality uh, for query performance. So we want to keep the one where we expect um, the lower cardinality. Um, so for example, a template is the basis for many things, but something is based on only one template, most likely. So since the cardinality would be less going in the is based on direction, we will keep that one. Um, now, this this is just a rule of thumb. It can be overridden when we overwhelmingly think of and use the predicates in the opposite direction. For example, 
what is uh, Michael's social security number versus whose social security number is this? We're, we're very likely to be asking that first question, but um, it's hard to, it's much rarer to think of a use case where we're looking at some social security number and asking who it belongs to. So in that case, uh, despite the cardinality consideration, we will keep is identified by. And in some cases, it's not really clear which way it goes, is about versus is described by. Um, and so we will just make a choice um, based on sort of gut feelings, I guess. And you don't have to worry about losing your inverses because all the inverses that are removed from just core will be provided in a separate file uh, for an optional import. Uh, one thing, can I just do yeah. something in here, Rebecca? Mm -hmm. Thanks. One thing we've talked about, and I don't know what final decision we've made is, is to have in that inverses file of suggested names for all the other inverses. Have we gone away from that suggestion, or is that what we're thinking of doing still? Um, you mean uh, suggestions for inverses that we never defined? Yeah, oh, just like, uh, so just in other words, so if, oh. if there's a property that three different people decide, hey, I want an inverse of that property, oh. and three different people create three different mm -hmm. names. Yeah, I remember we talked about this. I don't recall whether we came up with a decision or yeah. what decision. Um, Probably in the short term, we won't do anything. Yeah, I think not. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so on the next slide. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to just, I'll jump, your slides are coming right after. This is just, okay. to, in, this is just so, to introduce the idea. Right, okay, so we are going to be adding a file of inferred subclasses you can see this in uh, issue number 714 in the repository. So what's the motivation for this? Um, the, the, we often use a pattern like the one you see here, where we call this a distinctionary pattern because what it does is to formalize the particular way in which a subclass specializes its superclass. So for example, what we're saying here is an intergovernmental organization is an organization which has two government organizations as members. So we're saying it's an organization and this is how it's different from, you know, any other type of organization. This is what distinguishes it. Now the problem here is you can see we're not anywhere stating explicitly that the intergovernmental organization is a subclass of either organization or the restriction. And there's some, you can go to the next one. Um, so there are tools and reasoners that are not able to infer that subclass relationship from that pattern. Um, so for example, some visualization tools, some, um, some triple stores, um, shackle, unless you turn owl reasoning on, which is um, generally prohibitive based on performance, we'll not be able to make that uh, in subclass inference. So we want to provide these for people uh, who need those inference, who need those assertions, uh, a, a file of materialized subclass axioms. Um, and I believe Justin can speak to this a little bit better than I can because he's the one implementing it. But the plan, as I understand it, is to add a function to Onto tool to materialize those axioms into a separate file um, and include that file in the release package. And possibly for development purposes, we'll be adding it to a pre commit hook so that it's updated during development, you know, every time there's a commit. Um, onto a tool, in case you're not familiar mm -hmm. with it, is a repository also in the Semantic Arts uh, organization on GitHub, and it started as a couple of different tools um, just to make some changes to uh, the ontology files to, to prepare them for release. And then it grew and grew as we thought of more things we wanted to add. Um, so now it runs in shackle shapes to, to validate the ontology. 
Um, and uh, let's see, I think of other examples of what it does, but you can look at the uh, documentation, the readme of that um, repository. It's actually the repository is named ontology hyphen toolkit and the um, executable file is onto a tool. It's a Python uh, application. So as you can see, we're, we're generally trending in the direction of adding supplemental files to our release packages for things that we don't want to include in just course. So the inverses, the subclass assertions, we're already providing RDFS annotations uh, when we switched from RDFS label and comment to SCOS annotations, we also now provide the RDFS annotations in another file for people who are dependent on those in their applications. So this is kind of a direction overall that we're moving into. Um, Justin, do you want to say anything more about this? Oh, no, I, I think you covered it well, Rebecca. Um, maybe the one thing I'll add is, um... It, we, we, about uh, GIST, we say that it's an OWL2 DL uh, ontology. And so whenever you're looking for um, a free reasoner so that this can be run in anybody's CI pipeline, it kind of cuts down the list of reasoners pretty substantially. Um, so it's kind of a, yeah, had to, there's not many to pick from. Also, I'll say there's a lot of new reasoners being developed, some really interesting ones, but one of the, it's maybe a little unfortunate at the moment, they don't state which OWL profile they support. So, so even if I wanted to use a new one, which there are a lot, actually some of the newer ones are a lot easier to execute and get some materialized, materialized inferences out of, uh, it's not clear that they support all the entailments that, that just is intended to uh, 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 support. So, so yeah, so I've got kind of a small list of reasoners I'm going through and uh, so far, uh, it looks like the it might be the Hermit Reasoner because that's actually the one that ships with Protege, and uh, it's it's the one we typically use whenever we're whenever we're developing GIST in Protege. That's the one we're we're looking at inferences with as well. So it makes sense to use this in a hands-off fashion uh, in a workflow or a CI pipeline to do the materialization. That's it. Thank you, Justin and Rebecca. One comment I will throw in there since we've got plenty of time. This is born from experience of taking the ontology, putting it in the triple store, running an inference and thinking, gosh, dang it, why isn't this thing the subclass? And then you say, oh, for crying out loud, okay, let me go into Protege, let me do the materialized inferences, let me select it with click the right click boxes, export the file, and then load it in there, and then life is good. So this is like, we've done that too many times. Let's just clean this up and make it easy for people. Um, so this is the final comment. Um, okay. Next and last for today, I'm going to make a couple of comments about units and magnitudes and things that we've been discovering. So a lot of this is based what well, this was. All of this was triggered by uh, Phil Blackwood, who I'm not sure if he's on the call. He had a conflict earlier part of the meeting. Um, so he he took a lot of time, looked at just more broadly and made a lot of interesting comments, but he looked really deeply at see, the units and magnitudes and pointed out a number of things. Um, that are important. And so this is response to that and come many conversations we've had. So this is a highlight of some of the things that might change next time around. Um, one relatively small thing is just the name. We had a class called standard unit and we have a property called has standard unit. So for example, if you say mile, what's the standard unit for a mile is the unit of measure, but what's the standard unit? Well, the standard unit is meter. Kilometer is the unit of measure. It's standard unit is also meter. Right, so there's lots of standard units, but now I've, I discovered once on Wikipedia that there's actually a formal scientific name. It's not called standard unit, it's called coherent unit, but nobody ever heard of coherent unit, including me. And so I, when I look at it, it's still kind of my eyes glaze over. So we thought, well, why not just change it back to something that people can easily understand and then have a scope note that says, by the way, the formal physics term for this is coherent unit. So what is it exactly? It's something that has a conversion of one. So if 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 it's a meter, if the standard unit for distance is meter, then what's the conversion to meter is one. And also it has itself as the standard unit. So that's one way to think of it. Okay. Um, another thing that was discovered long time ago, and we considered it and rejected the idea of making the change, was that we have currently 
a, an action that says unit of measure is disjoint from a magnitude. So this creates an interesting situation. So meter is a unit of measure. And if you want to create a magnitude that equals one meter, you have a new instance with a new IRI and it has a numeric value of one and it has a unit of measure of meter. And so you ask yourself the question, why do we have two IRIs? One that is meter, the unit of measure meter, and the other is meter, the magnitude meter. It just didn't make sense to have two things that mean exactly the same thing in the real world. So we actually considered how that would work and we thought, you know, we could make that change. It's not going to make them but such of a difference. Let's just leave it. And then somebody came along, Ted um, Hill, I think, forget his name. He said, hey, you know what, Michael? Uh, if you go to the whatever the standards body is that decides about these things, they literally define unit of measure to be um, uh, what we call a magnitude. It is a quantity. So meter is a meter is a meter, whether it's a unit of measure. So that suggests a change to the ontology to say, instead of unit of measure being disjoint from magnitude, it's a subclass of magnitude. And what makes it a unit of measure? Um, we'll have to, I, I've, I worked all those details out. I can't remember it off the top of my head. But essentially, unit of measure is a special one um, that's not just any old magnitude, it's, it's a unit. Um, okay, so that's that. The other thing we, when numerous people pointed out the, a problem with this notion of ratio unit, ratio magnitude, product unit, and product magnitude. So what's a product unit? Well, a square meter, which is meter times meter, that's a product of meter and meter. What's a ratio of magnitude? Speed, meters per second. But it turns out when you get into complex units, like say, Newton, Newton is a measure of force. There's lots of different ways you can express a unit. You can express it as a product of two units, or you can express it as a ratio of two units. You can do whatever you like. There's lots of different ways to skin a cat, as it were. So it didn't actually mean anything to say something was a product unit. So we're probably going to, it's on the table to get rid of those. Lastly, I think for this discussion today, um, there's a number of other, maybe perhaps minor things, but the last thing I'm going to mention today is that we have, and there, there are talks that I've given and just councils over the years, a rich semantic approach for representing complex units, such as, you know, meters per, so acceleration is meters per second squared. And we have a way to build that up using numerators and denominators and multipliers and multiple counts. And you could have, and you could infer the, you could recursively calculate the, the conversions from the individual conversions. And it all seemed rather clever and powerful um, and seemed like it probably that'll be useful one day, but it turns out um, <laughs> that day has not yet arised. And so, it's still there, and I think the main use would be if you're teaching units for people and you wanted to melt, you wanted to have an app to drive all that, this would be useful, but we haven't had that arise and it's unlikely to arise. So what we're going to do, not so much change just, but to have a, a simpler approach. So instead of saying, hey, what you really should do is use multiplier and multiplicand and, and, and whatnot, numerator and denominator to build up the thing bit by bit by bit. Don't bother doing that. You do this instead. Just create a new subclass of magnitude. So for example, kinematic viscosity is something I never heard of. It's it's the amount of stuff that can flow through an area. And it's, it's, if it's very, very viscous, then not much stuff will flow through for, for unit time. And if it is very viscous, a lot will. So it's something that's important for crude oil. So what you do is you create a new subclass of magnitude. So you can have something that is an amount of kinematic viscosity, create a unit of measure for that, which turns out to be uh, something like area per unit time, something like that. And then specify a direct conversion to the standard unit. So instead of you bothering with numerator and denominator and multiplier and multiplicand, just have a direct conversion to the standard unit. So for example, instead of meters per second square, you know, you don't have to do all those intermediate steps. So that's it for today. Um, just a quick summary slide for which was at the end of the overall introduction to just. So that's it for today. We got a few minutes left. Um, 
you can take your eight minutes back or I'm happy to answer any questions that people may have about this or anything related to just. Michael, I think you mean just 11.1.0 instead of 11.0.0 on your last slide. I do. To download. It keeps <laughs> <Not> changing. <down>. <laughs> <laughs> And I did put links to the Semantic Arts GIST page and the GitHub in the chat for yeah. anyone to click link to those. Have to edit the link and the label. By the time this, this gets shown again, it's going to be 11.2 or 12.0. It's all good. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, as long as it, if nobody else has any questions or comments, I'll just add a quick note about something Michael talked about uh, when he was discussing the properties um, and the difference between just name and just description and annotations like SCOS uh, prep label and SCOS definition. Well, first of all, the other the SCOS ones are annotations. The just ones are data type properties. We we think those are um real world assertions so it's it's a fact in the real world that my name is rebecca Eunice. that's not a label that somebody decided to give me um and i don't have a definition uh real world things generally don't have definitions though there are cases where they do um whereas giving something a label and a definition is something you do when defining an ontology or a taxonomy, because obviously you, those things are, uh, don't have real world names and descriptions. Um, just like now, something that's a little bit fuzzy is you can give a definition for something like the US Supreme Court, um, but you could also give it a description for things that are not um, part of the, the actual definition. So you could say it meets uh, or it has nine members. That's not actually even part of the definition um, of the US Supreme Court. So that could be used to provide additional descriptions. Thank you, Rebecca. Any other questions, comments? Any question from Greg. Greg? Yeah, I have, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. OK, um, so this um, change around units, um, I'm just wondering if there's a more just stepping back, if there's a more general conclusion here or what you would say about this. So it, it seems that um, doing mathematical calculations about units uh, in an ontology just hasn't materialized as sort of a real need. And I'm wondering if if that idea of sort of doing mathematical calculation through the structure of an ontology is that in general not a good idea or are there instances where uh, it really does make sense to model mathematical relations in the ontology because you actually reason over that and then perform calculations in your ontology so i don't know if you have thoughts on that comments that is a good question i wish dave was here because he may have a thought we always thought and we always wanted to because it's kind of fun you design something and you want to use it that we would be doing this recursive calculation of conversions but it turns out even if you could, even if it was useful to be able to do that, there's a trade-off, which is round off error, right? And so there is a direct conversion. Just look it up on Google and bring in as many digit as many um, digits of precision that you want. So in answer to your question, I it just has the need hasn't arisen, and I don't know if if it will one day or not, but we have we're not removing the possibility of creating that. We're just going to try to encourage through examples that there's a different simpler way. Um, and I guess a follow up question uh, sort of, of a different nature would be um, there's assumption that there are standard units then for all these things we would want to quantify. Um, and I just don't know. Is, is that actually the case that anything you can think of that would be a magnitude? Someone's decided what the standard unit for that is so that that conversion is always going to be back to one definitive well, that's a, unit. That's an interesting question. The, uh, in terms of the physics units, there always is a standard unit. You know, like for because they're all they're all built on the base unit. So the standard unit for distance is meter the standard units for time length of time is second so if you build up anything that's based on time meters distance and second for example cubic meter 
Well, the standard unit is just meter times meter times meter, and you can talk about cubic parsecs if you want to, but that's not the standard unit. Cubic parsec, you'd want to convert that down to cubic meters. It'd be a hell of a number. Yeah, but, but there, are there any other concepts that we give magnitude to that go beyond distance and time or, or you know, just... Well, there's, you know, one of the things that Phil pointed out is very interesting. There's lots of business metrics, you know, KPIs, that they're kind they they... They feel like they're magnitudes of the sort, you know, number of changes per week for a software development thing, maybe. But what's a change? A change is not something in physics. Where a meter is in physics, you know, lumens are in physics. So some things, if they're outside of the standard physics world, you have to make up your own unit. Like, for example, bits. We have something called information quantity. I don't think it's officially in the SI units, um, but we created something. We arbitrarily decided that the base unit would be bit instead of byte. So if you, I just did this the other day for one of our clients, if you create a unit called for megabyte, because that's how you want to measure file size, well, the conversion from megabyte down to bit is 8 million, because there's a million bytes and then there's eight bits to a byte. So that's where you just, sometimes it's just an arbitrary decision. We could have chosen byte, Right, and then say a bit is an eighth of a byte, but uh, I don't know what the thinking was, but we just went with bit. So yeah, or so you, you, you raise like yeah. consumer sentiment. So you know, is there a standard unit for the weight of consumer sentiment, or you know, um, about a product? Well, yeah, instance? exactly. That's a pure number. Exactly. Those things that they arise all the time, or things like averages. We did some work with people measuring sports teams attendance at stadiums. You know. What's the average attendance for a game at a stadium? Things like that. There's no standard unit per se. You just arbitrarily make Person something. Person, you use the standard unit of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's a bit, we have something in just called aspect, uh, which is a lot like, you know, characteristic, um, but it's it's uh, it's used in certain situations, but it's, it's interesting. And we are right at the top of the hour. One final very short question. Or are we going to call it good to go? I just offer a quick use case for using unit conversions. And if you're going to use the ontology and its instance data to drive simulation or optimization engines, you also mm -hmm. often need to do conversions, et cetera, to normalize the data for those engines to ingest. And I also usually use QUDT as my units and framework because it's it's very extensive and they've thought through a lot of these problems. It's a little well, takes a little bit to understand, but I think I find it to That's be That's true. QDT, but well, they have direct conversions. Well, it'd be interesting to have a side conversation. Um, QDT is, in terms of it, the units it provides, it's, it's extremely extensive. They they did a lot of things it just didn't attempt to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Great Thank presentation. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. Have Thank a great so. Thursday. Thank you. Bye-bye.